Man, I love my church. Hey, we are honored to stand up here tonight together as one man, as a brotherhood amongst our family, our brotherhood. God has fulfilled promises in our life, and y'all are the fulfillment of that promise in our life, of an eternal brotherhood. We are walking in an eternal purpose before our God. Saints, we are living in days where we can recognize how the Lord is bringing us from one degree of glory to another. Can you feel that? You can feel, you're like, Lord, this is amazing what you're doing right now. And then he does it again. You're like, this, this can't get any better. And then the Lord does it again. We're experiencing the Lord taking us from strength to strength. We are, we are witnessing men and women rise up in the hardest and most difficult times. And we are seeing them being strengthened and strengthened again and again. And we are advancing the kingdom of God, moving from faith to faith. Our faith is increasing, church. We are, our faith is increasing because we're doing work. Because we're actually stepping out. God is able to meet our faith and increase our faith so we can do the next work. God is with us as we're working to fulfill the calling placed on our lives. That is because we are focusing our efforts to His cause. You, you realize that when you take your eyes off of yourself and when you turn your eyes to the Lord and you say, Lord, whatever you want to do, you can feel his affirmation. You can feel his presence. You can feel that witness of his spirit with you, empowering you to do the work. Man, it is so good to turn our eyes on the Lord's cause. Everyone here has a God given purpose to both discover and execute for the glory of God. Andreas. You're going to discover that mezuzah, my brother. The Lord is making it known. I'm watching you rise up. Your life is not without meaning. Your efforts in the Lord are not futile. No. We give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because we know God is with us, completing the work that he began in us. Amen. Saints, tonight we want to inspire you to give yourself fully to the work. Cool. What we have to share with you tonight is a simple message. It is one that we've seen walked out before us and that we are implementing in our daily lives. Our aim tonight is to inspire right action founded on trust grounded obedience and to remind you of the security that you have as a son of the living God. Amen. This goes so much further than a simple rallying cry. It's one thing to believe the Lord can do great things through his church body. But what we want to get down tonight is how the Lord wants to do the great things through you. Amen. Saints, tonight the title of our message is The Light of Life. Yeah. Say that after me. The Light of Life. Amen. Well, good evening, Saints. Yeah. It is so good and it's such an honor to be back in the house of God with you tonight. There is honestly no place I'd rather be. Amen. And I just want to thank you on behalf of my wife, my family, the homestead. Thank you for warring alongside of us. So with that being said, we're going to jump right into scripture. And we're going to see how we can walk out being the light of life. Amen. Sound booth, can we get Ephesians 5? Picking up in verse 13. Y'all go ahead and say light of life when you get there. It says, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Saints, we know that Paul lived in dark days. We to ourselves, we live in some dark days. He said the days of this time are evil. That was then, and we're, all talk, we're also talking about now. And if we primarily focus on the darkness around us, it would easily consume most of our thoughts, would it not? Yeah. It is easy to be overwhelmed, but the times, by the times that we are in, there's a lot of civil unrest, there's assassination attempts, yeah. 
His wickedness running rampant. The days are, in fact, evil. But the Lord has a plan to deal with the darkness. And that plan starts with us tonight. Once a lamp is lit, saints, it becomes a light for the whole house. You have been chosen. Each and every one of you sitting in these seats have been chosen by God to be a light. To give light and darkness in the dark days. He chose you, saints, to be the light. So we shouldn't be overwhelmed by the darkness. Instead, we should see more opportunities to shine forth the light that he has put inside of our very souls. We shouldn't see the darkness as hopeless. Instead, we should make the best use of every opportunity, as the scripture states. Light shines the brightest in the darkness. So... Just a little personal example of what this looks like, of making the most of every opportunity. This started for me last week. I uh, had the opportunity to train uh, someone coming on board with uh, the ProTech team, and I kind of found it a little bit to be an annoyance to have to pour out into him, to share with him what the Lord has done to me. And it was absolutely carnal, wicked, and got to repent of that. What the Lord was actually preparing in me, though, was the light that I was going to have to be and also the opportunity to seize in every moment where darkness wanted to rear its head. So in Isaiah 58.10, I'm just going to catch a little snippet from Sunday. We hit on that even in gloom, you can shine as bright as the noonday. So in the darkest of times of my life, it was actually the first thing that I had It was actually the first time that I had the light of Christ shining through me to guide me every decision along the way in this past weekend. And I'm sure many of you are aware, and we thank you for standing alongside of us, for comforting us with words of Scripture, for uh, the pastors, the elders, the brothers showing up, comforting us, praying with us, warring alongside us. So family, when the light of God is radiating from within a man, what is hidden in the darkness becomes visible. The darkness that I was up against alongside my wife was the haymaker of a report that we had a serious problem on on our hands. Anna was having a second ectopic pregnancy, and we only found out three days prior to that that we were actually pregnant. She was having some sharp pains in her stomach, and we prayed. We wanted to feel and know that the Lord was with us and that these are just things that were going to be natural. But in fact, something was growing inside of her and causing deeper and sharper pains in her body. Honor was being as strong as I can possibly be alongside of her. And in that moment, I, had to, I got to comfort her, take her by the hand, pray over her, lead her, call my brothers alongside of her. And I got to make the most of every opportunity by bringing my brothers in on the fight. Amen. So we go to the ER and we're sitting there with like explaining to you know explaining to the assistant what's going on and we we find out that there's no ultrasound tech in in the actual facility so i don't know even know why we went there but we went there in faith and then we end up having to wait a long time for the the tech to get there this is when gloom actually began to creep in creep up on the radar and we needed to fight to stay in the spirit. It was, it was a difficult, difficult task. But we knew that the Lord was with us, so I quickly reached out to my brothers, and I made them aware of what was happening. I got hold of the pastors, hey, this is what's happening. And immediately, they came alongside of us, and they helped to fight with us. Yeah. Amen. So, amongst that haymaker, there was a flurry of body shots, just bad news, slow reports, waiting, waiting, playing the waiting game. And as children of God, we must be wise and discerning or the enemy will devour us at every opportunity and the Lord is wanting us to have victory. In that moment of waiting, we got to stand up. We got to say no to what they were trying to push upon us, which is uh, medication after medication to subside the pain. But we know that childbirth comes through labor pains. And so we were standing confident in that, that this this is going to be all right. We're going to fight through this. I'm passing my wife through this. She's standing firm. She's remaining confident throughout this whole time. And there was still a little 
gloom lingering in the back of our minds. So we actually we get the report from the from the ultrasound tech at that time. The doctor comes in, shares with us, shares with us the bad report, and immediately our hearts drop. Like, how can this be? I mean, we're we're now fighting for life in that present moment, and it was a difficult thing. When the surgeon, after we got into a uh, an ambulance and we got rushed off to the to the hospital where the surgery would be done, the surgeon comes in and she's telling us immediately we need to have you know uh, get her upstairs to the to the OR, and decision after decision had to be made in those very you know split second moments, and it was difficult, but the beautiful thing about it is when I got to invite my brothers in to fight with me. They were actually there at the hospital before the ambulance got there. And it was absolutely incredible. And knowing that brought the light back inside of me. Knowing that allowed me to stand confident, to look at the nurses, to hear the bad reports, and to comfort my wife and also say, you know what, the hell with that. We're not going to give way to fear. We're going to see what the next step is. We're going to leave room for the Lord to work in the situation. So when the surgeon entered the room, Again, she wanted to move right into the operating room. But when she learned of what we were actually fighting for, the life that was inside of Anna and the um, difficulty that she had in the pregnancy prior, she, her heart was just open wide up to compassion, was open wide up to uh, be more caring and more understanding of the situation. And what she encourages us with is, we're going to fight to keep this tube intact. We're going to fight to make sure that life is preserved here. She was very empathetic with us, although that's not what we were looking for, um, but it was an opportunity to jump all over. God, in that moment, highlighted, this is another life that I want you to fight for. Yeah. And that did something inside of me. That, that shifted my whole attention to um, take my wife alongside of me, encourage her, yes, and also, hey, babe, this woman, she has a calling on her life. She's living it out. She's, uh, she has skillful hands. We trust her. She's a woman of God. It turns out that her husband is a pastor. So this is just a, a, a short testimony of how good God is when you're not giving way to the fear, when you're not you know, worried about any uh, difficult situation, and you're not running around without a clue. The Lord actually sets these things in place to reassure you that everything's going to be all right throughout the whole process. This caused my lamp to burn even brighter. And it was difficult. The fight, of course, was, was very difficult, very tiresome. But when you have a body of believers, when, and that is you. That is you. You are the body of believers. You are my family. Amen. Knowing that you guys are praying for us, knowing that there's physical presence of brothers and sisters, mighty uh, warriors for God's kingdom around you, it just does something different inside of you. It allows you to get off of uh, the immediate um, troubling times and actually focus more on what God is wanting to do. And that attention shift was everything. Yeah. So again, saints, you are, the light of the, you are the light of the world. So look for every opportunity to seize in order for God to get the glory out of the situation. Yeah. See, this story started at 3 p.m. on Saturday. By the time we met Nick at the hospital, it was 9 p.m. By the time Anna was in the operating room, it was 4 in the morning the next day. It's a long time. There's a lot of details that, that aren't in there. But what I can tell you as Nick's brother and as Anna's brother, to see the two of you stand strong, to see you depend on your family, to see you lead your wife well, to see your wife follow your leadership well in every single decision. Look, when you're in the midst of trial, you don't know how long it's going to take. You, you don't know that time frame, and sometimes that's the hardest thing is because, because you're like, okay, I, I can stick it out as long as I know how long I have to stick it out for. But what about when you don't know that? You know, they're fighting for life for their unborn child, and then that transitions into fighting for the life of your wife. Fighting, having to sit there and, and not knowing what to do. There was no plan for this. There was no way to, to try to figure it out ahead of time and go through that step. 
uh, go through each step accordingly. We had to face it head on every step of the way. And Nick, you stood like a man. You got on your face before God and you cried out to him. And you were the light of life in that room. Look, there is many stories like this in this room. There are many, many stories where you're going through a hard, difficult, dark time. And you have to rise up and be the light. You don't know the type of impact that it's going to have. I've never been through what Nick's been through. But getting to stand there and fight for him showed me what it looks like to fight for somebody else. Watching him go through it, let me know that he's going to do, Nick and Anna, you're going to do this for other husbands and wives. You're going to fight for their children. You're going to fight for their lives. And you displayed it in that room. When you see a man like Nick Rosales, it's hard to imagine him in a place of vulnerability. It, it, it's hard to see him as weak. Uh, he's three years younger than me, and for as long as I've known him, he's been beating me up. Not true. With, along with the help of my other little brother. But when I mean, you look at Nick, you don't, you don't see that vulnerability. You don't see that weakness. But when you're in a moment like that, Man, it is crucial to actually be vulnerable, to, to be weak, to, to realize I don't have it all, and to cry out to the Lord. And even in the weakness and the vulnerability, we got to watch Nick endure through it, and he didn't give up. He didn't stop. He's standing here tonight testifying about it. At every step, he kept welcoming in brothers and sisters to pray for him. He kept telling the doctors, hey, just wait a minute. We're going to pray about this. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what we want to do. Every time they ask Anna, what do you want to do? She says, whatever my husband says. Come on. Is that not being the light of life? Come on. Look, we can't grow weary in doing good. Nick sought out opportunities right in front of him with the hope of reaping a righteous harvest. Galatians 6, 9 and 10 talks about this it says let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up it doesn't say you will reap a harvest at this time it says if you do not give up therefore as we have the opportunity let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers saints it's crucial for us to make the most of every opportunity it is crucial for us to recognize the times that we're living in, to understand this is something that I must endure and go through, and not just go through it, but go through it well. Go through it and do good. Go through it and look for the opportunities right in front of you. When the surgeon comes out to give Nick the news and she's broken, and Nick says, hey, can I pray for you? <laughs> you have, <laughs> we, I mean, it's incredible to stand there and watch in one moment on his face before God stand up and say, let me pray for you. Literally, the words of her mouth was, I felt that. We got to surround, surround her and pray for her. She said, I felt that. And, and it, it, the testimony is still growing. It doesn't stop there. It's an increasing testimony. We don't know how long it's going to be until we, until we reap that harvest, but we can't give up. We've got to seize every opportunity, and we've got to continue to be the light of life. The promise is that, God is, is that at God's proper time, we will reap a harvest as long as we do not give up. We have a hope in re reaping a harvest, but our motivation in seizing opportunities to do good is founded upon the example that's been set before us. It's not about what you're going to reap. It's about who has gone before you and done it. So you can do the same thing. Who wants to do the same thing? I do. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus goes up on a mountain and he's teaching his disciples and he's telling them wild things like, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm sure it was a shock to the disciples to hear about meekness and humility and, and that's what moves you forward in the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching them about letting their light shine in Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He's teaching them how to live a righteous life by making peace with their accusers, being faithful to their wives, being honest, and being a blessing to those who hurt you. And he keeps going in chapter 6. So let's turn 
to Matthew 6, verse 19. He keeps going in chapter 6 by telling them what should be their motivation for their righteousness. It's not enough to just do good things. Where is that coming from within you? It's not to be praised by men, but it's to please God. So verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So don't be righteous for your own sake. Don't do good things so that people will like you. No, do it because of a treasure in heaven. Your heart's desire is for the Lord's kingdom and for Him, for your King, and not for yourself. What's the treasure? He just covered the topic of fasting in secret. And what what would come to mind to a Jewish audience? Maybe it's something like Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Oh, it's for them. It's not for us. The treasure wasn't for me. The treasure isn't me. The treasure is pouring my life out for them. The reward of God's righteousness in others is your treasure. The ultimate goal of your salvation as a Gentile is exactly what Paul writes in Romans 11, 11, to make Israel envious. How will we make Israel envious if there's nothing to see? What does a light before men mean if there's nothing to actually look at? Oh, it has to be something that's actually done. It's not just a feeling inside. Well, I feel bad for them. Oh, I have compassion for them. I'm going to pray for you later. No, that's not what Isaiah says. He says, clothe the naked and feed the hungry. Do good. Do good. But it starts with the one person, the one life that's right in front of you. Do good to be a light in the darkness. Do good for the sake of others and not for yourself. The whole context of Matthew 5 and 6 is doing good deeds for people in front of you without expectation of getting anything out of it for yourself. Do you guys seeing that? Aim your life at loving people in darkness like God God does. And he goes on, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So Jesus is teaching his disciples an important lesson here your eyes will lead your actions where your treasure is what you desire actually produces an action in you what you want is what you get the target that you set that you're aiming for your life is the target that you hit doesn't it Okay, so the lamp of the eye shows the feet where to stand. Whatever you're looking to do, that's what you end up doing. Do you ever plan on going to the store and then you end up at a football game? 
Never. Especially not in this church. You do what you set out to do. If your eyes are looking for the good to do, that's what you find and that's what you do. If I'm always looking at how to benefit myself, then that's what I'm going to do. If my heart and my treasure are found in what I can get for myself, then I'll get everything I desire. And you know what Jesus calls that? Darkness. Darkness. But if I'm looking for the good things to do, I will find them. Because our desires lead us. Our hearts move us to action. You know, we can't plan out how every, every interaction and every opportunity, how it's going to go. What Caleb's talking about, and we're saying making the most of every opportunity and then look to do good, because there's opportunities all around us. And I know you, church. I know that when you go out from here, you're looking to perform out there what you've practiced in here. You're looking for those opportunities, but then you've got to look to do good. You have to, you have to go and actually apply that in that, pers- in that life that's right in front of you. Yeah. See, when I was in the VA hospital a couple weeks ago, I didn't know the Lord was preparing me th- to then stand alongside my brother in the hospital. When I met a man at the gas station I'm ministering to him, I didn't know that what, what that was preparing me for was to stand there and be ready to minister for the, for the next life when I'm there in the hospital standing alongside Nick. But the Lord was preparing me for that because I was looking for the opportunities, looking to do good, looking to pour out into somebody else and give them what I have and be the need to fit the need that they have. And the Lord prepared me for the next one. The Lord brought me from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from faith to faith. Saints, you can trust that when you're focused on the one life that's right in front of you and you're focused on being a light to that life, right? Not just being there and then checking a box and saying, yeah, I talked to somebody today, but being the light, being the good, be filling the need that they have. Saints, you have to have your eyes looking for that. You have to be looking for those opportunities. So guys, when Paul took his eyes off of himself, he began finding people all around him that were in desperate need of light. He found those in darkness and he became light for them. His eyes full of light. He was searching for someone to pour out grace and mercy on and the Lord graciously allowed him to find them. We're supposed to make the most of every opportunity, right? Yeah. In order to do that, we need to pick our eyes up. We need to be looking for those opportunities. And I know that we learned this past Sunday that the opportunities are all around us. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a white harvest. It is ripe for us to go out and to harvest what the Lord is desiring to bring here in this house, to fill these empty seats. When we pick up our heads off of our situation, we get our head out of the gloominess of the day, we can see that there is clearly someone right in front of me to witness to, and by us going out and extending our hand the way the Lord has done for us, and we extend mercy, we extend grace, we share with them the light that is beaming inside of us, we bring them into these seats. We fill the house of God through righteous acts of obedience. I'm glad you all agree with that, because it is a true word, and I find myself guilty of that sometimes, and I shared with you my experience last week of, of wanting to Turn my head when the gentleman is walking to me. Actually, I didn't hear what he said to me. But in fact, thank you, Ben. In fact, there was something that he's seen inside of me that he was drawn to. So who am I to push him away? If I, if I know that the Lord has uh, allowed me to have an experience to him, if I turn to him at any point, he never turns away from me. He has exactly what I need. I can trust that what he has in his hands for me is something good. He never turns. Amen. He never shuts his ears. He never looks away. He's always having, he always has his hands extended in our situation, looking to pour out the grace and mercy. In general, we don't have a problem with our intentions. Of course, we want to do something good for the Lord. Of course, we want to take care for, of the people in front of us. But men of God have to wrestle with their own inadequacies. Yeah. It's a very real thing. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. We know that Sarah laughed at having a son. 
We know Moses asked the Lord to send someone else. Elijah didn't think he could continue in ministry, so he asked the Lord to let him die. Wow. We have good intentions, but we suffer from disbelief. We trust the Lord can do great things, do we not? Yes. But we, we aren't so sure if they can happen through us. Wow. Soundboard, let's go to Judges 6, 14 through 15. Y'all go ahead and say, light of life when you get there. Say what? All right. The Lord turned to him and said, go in strength. You have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord saw Gideon as he was hiding. As Gideon saw himself as weak, the Lord called him mighty. When we find areas of weakness in our life and we want to go isolate and shelter, know that the Lord has called you to be mighty, to rise up and to stand up and to go and to save those that he desires to save. I have a job for you tonight, saints. You guys are mighty. You guys are chosen. Pick up your heads. Pick up your, heart, your heads in the di most difficult of times and know that the Lord's light is shining upon you. He is strengthening you. He has called you. He has made you warriors to go out there and to steal back from the captives what he desires. Amen. <laughs> it's almost like you have to pour out your life for the life that's right in front of you. You're, you are anointed for the task. Just like Gideon was anointed for the task. He set him apart for a specific purpose. But Gideon's response is a lot like our response is some of the times. Oh, that's great for them. Oh, man. Ababola, he's so strong. R Rick is so steadfast. Cody is so compassionate. Spencer's so bold. And what we do is we build up our brothers, and that's great. Build up your brothers. But don't use that as an, as an excuse for yourself, but I'm not like that. Oh, no. God tells Gideon, go in the strength that you have. You're not too weak or too small. How does the Lord answer Gideon when, when he answers, oh, I'm too weak, I'm too small, I can't do it. In, in 616, and the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. And she'll strike the Midian, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. The answer, you don't have anything to do with the success. I'm going to be with you. Gideon was looking within himself for his strength and his might. He was saying, I'm looking here and I don't see what needs to, I don't have what I need to do this thing that you're telling me to do, God. He says, go in the strength that you do have. He felt inadequate because he wasn't strong enough. He wasn't as strong as he would have liked to be. He thought the Lord was looking for someone who had their own strength. But instead, he was looking for someone who was available. Oh, man, I just want to be available to the Lord. I want to be ready. I want to be watching. I want to be listening. Not so focused in my own inadequacies that I don't. No, instead, God promises something so much greater than you will be great. Instead, God promises, I will be with you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The Lord doesn't choose the mighty. The Lord doesn't choose the strongest of the strong. He doesn't choose those that are powerful on their own. He chooses people like us. 
people that are available. I showed up to the hospital, and I, I wanted to be ready to pour out and excited. But then there's also this fear, this anxiety. I don't know if I have what Nick needs right now. I don't, I don't know if I have the right words to say. And you have to wrestle through that, and you have to fight through that, and you have to kill that, and just say, God, I'm going to go anyway, and I'm just going to be available. You know, we, we have to pastor my wife through fear. It's her sister in there. What's going to happen? We don't, we don't know. Like Paul was saying, there's no playbook for this. We, we don't know exactly how it's going to work out, what's going to happen. We want to try and fix it ahead of time in our own minds. This is what I can do to fix this. And there's no answer like that. Because the Lord didn't tell us, hey, go fix the problem. He said, go and be there. And when you are there, you get to be an encouragement. When you are there, you get to share scriptures. When you are there, you get to pray with a brother. When you are there, you get to share the wisdom that the Lord's giving you that you can hear just a little bit clearer because you're like the coach in the corner, not the fighter in the middle of the ring. You get to actually be the church because you just showed up. You went where he called you to be. You had eyes looking for the good to do, and you just obeyed because he went with you. We, do, we don't just fix ourselves. We don't, we don't go off into a prayer closet and like, give me a couple weeks and then I'll show up. The Lord does all of that, strengthening you, giving you power, letting you pour out, letting you put to death the sin that's in your own heart, getting over fear. He does all that at the same time. We don't get to go work, work on ourselves somewhere else. The Lord's working in us as we go. As we're available, as we're going, as we're obedient, as we're watching, as we're acting, as we're showing the world the Lord's light, He does something in us. Not before, in the process. Saints, I'm going to tell you right now, I did not have all the answers in that room. I didn't know much about the topic other than what Anna has been through before, but this just felt like something completely different. Uh, actually getting to experience that for the first time, the only thing I could do was cry out, trust in the Lord, trust in my brothers alongside of me who are giving me scripture after scripture after scripture, strengthening me, empowering me, encouraging me through the Spirit, and the Lord supernaturally helped me have the right answers to give to these nurses, to give to these doctors of, no, look, I hear what you're saying, but this is what we're actually going to do. Yeah. I, know, I know this is a, a time-consuming matter, uh, and, and it's very precious right now, but we also need time to hear from the Lord. Yeah, Caleb said it best. We don't, we don't need to say, hey, go away and come back in two weeks and I have an answer for you. No, give us a second. Let us pray. And we got to demonstrate that for them. I mean, they're coming in and out the room, in and out the room, checking on us. And at the same time, we got brothers in rotation coming in and out the room, in and out the room, in and out the room, verse after verse, uh, busting out worship songs. I mean, allowing the Spirit to move in those opportunities. And then he drops the answer on us. Now's the time. There was a moment where Matt and Paul walked into the room and Anna's heart rate began to spike. And I was pretty nervous. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've seen this in a movie, but I am now living this out. I don't have the answers, don't know much about the topic, but I trust in God. And Piro, being the, uh, the boss, the amazing man of God that he is, is pacing in the room back and forth. You know, his hands gets behind him a little bit, and he's, he's peering out over his glasses, and he's watching the monitor. And all these numbers are being thrown up there, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I mean, help me now. <laughs> and, uh, and him doing that, 
it, it began to help me to, to shift my focus on what's swirling around the back of my mind to I trust this man of God. Yeah. I know this man of God. And he's watching and, and he's observing the monitor. So I begin to watch and observe the monitor. And it's just like all oh, hell is breaking loose. Anna is writhing in pain. I'm breaking up inside. Uh, this frail body of mine just begins to just break, break down. And the Lord is supernaturally sending his spirit and, and allowing me to keep it together. And in the same moment, I wanted to just fold and say, hey, let's just go ahead with the surgery already. And let's just let's get this out the way. I don't want to see her in this pain anymore. But the Lord brought me to that threshold of I'll never go back that way again. I could only go forward in this moment. Amen. He has given me the answer. He has given me the solution. And that is just to, to trust him, to stand upon the word, to stand upon what he's already shown us, and to walk this thing out boldly with all confidence. Yeah. Man, in that moment, we, we believe the, that was like the pinnacle of everything and that was going on inside of Anna. And through the prayer, through the, the Lord revealing the answer of, hey, remain calm. We have a mission. We have a plan. And that is to see life be preserved. Let's go through with the next step of what's available. And let's, force, let's, let's, let's push back. The enemies want to push against you. We're going to start pushing back here. Come on. Yeah. Not even, you know, a minute or two later, her heart rate just begins to come down. And Pastor Matt says, that's it. And when he said, that's it, I was like, that is it. Her body came back, was in, was in shalom, was at peace. She was, you know, being uh, able to get her breath back. I mean, she's going through some things. And me and my strength, I, I can't do anything in the physical in this moment. The only thing I could do was just be as strong as the Lord has allowed us to be together in that moment. I had to pick up my eyes. There was no more looking at a blurry floor because my eyes are covered with tears and, and everything else is going on. I had to pick up my eyes. I had to look around me and say, there's men of God standing here with me. I'm going to be okay. You know, I'm getting a little long-winded here, and I'm not sure where I'm at. But I'm going to tell you what. When I, was in the, when I was in the waiting room of the OR, I began to have my, my moment where I wanted to isolate. It is, a, it is a stupid, stupid thing to want to do that when you feel that you're at your weakest to isolate. The best thing you can do is give it all to the Lord, reach out, and trust that he is going to deliver you in that moment. I was waiting there. Everybody had kind of cleared out, <clears throat> those who were there. And uh, the last thing that we can do is just wait, wait to hear what the results were going to be. And... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to destroy the whole fifth floor of that hospital. Like, everything possible. That's, and I felt like it was in my right to do that. <laughs> I got the right to destroy this place. I did not. <laughs> I did not have that right. But Paul had every right as a son of God to stand alongside me and put his hand upon my shoulder and say, Brother, you are strengthened. You are empowered. You are a mighty warrior. And you know what? We have that right to go out there and to do the same thing for the people that are hurting the most. The same people that wanted to isolate in our workplace, isolate at home. We can't let, it, we can't let others slip down that, that slippery slope. We have to be the ones to have a, a, a steadfast mind, a so on mind, right? A so on mind, being able to, to say, be saved in that moment and have the Lord alongside of you and know with all confidence, hey, I don't know what this person is going through. I don't know uh, the, the topic. I don't have the answer. But I trust that if I in, begin to intercede with this person in front of me, the Lord is going to give that person exactly what they need. Amen. Look, I too will become a bit unhinged. Because when you see your brother on his face and you hear him weeping, the way that he's weeping, all you want to do is be able to step in there and, and, and take that from him. The same way that he wants to step in and take that pain and that suffering from Anna. I want to step in and do that, and I can't. This is something that he must walk through. This is something that Anna had to go through. Look, she, her heart rate came down before she got the morphine. Be before the pain went away, 
her heart rate went down. That was a trust. That was a display of trust grounded obedience in the Lord. And the Lord blessed that. And when Nick is on his face trembling before God, it didn't matter who else was there. He's trembling before God. You know, shows up, the elevator doors open up, and the pastors and the elders and the other brothers that were there, Ubang and Dylan, come in and surrounding them. And Nick lifts up his eyes, and just like that word that was given during prophecy, Marlon, he begins to see the mighty army of the Lord surrounding him. From that moment, Nick never looked back. There was nothing shaky or uncertain about him. There was no doubt in his mind, God, you're going to come through for me. I'm not focused on the results. I know how weak I look right now. This is what, we, what inspires other men. When you can be weak, but not focus on your weakness, God will show up and make you strong. He will show up and make you powerful. He will show up and make you be able to reach out your hand and pray for the one who your loved one's life is entrusted to. And to know, God, you're going to come through right now. Saints, you are the light of life. You have everything that you need to reach out and pour into the life that's right in front of you. Don't think your inadequacies and your vulnerability matters. Don't let that get in the way. Don't let that hinder you from being God's voice, from being his arm in that moment. I didn't know what to say to Nick. I just knew I needed to be there and be his brother. And the Lord gave us the words over and over again. We, we laughed about it. We weren't like Job's counsel. We weren't like Job's friends who were a terrible, gave terrible advice and did nothing to help. No, we sat down on the floor next to him. We just sat there with him. We shared words. We sang worship. We told some funny stories. And God is so good to us in these moments. What we do as the family of believers and what we do for one another, we will take and do out there. And I'll tell you right now, that is attractive and that inspires others and that wants, they want to come in to that. We are all here because we love this community. We, lo we have not gotten this anywhere else. How much more so in the times we're living in right now? Lives are longing for what we have. Saints, build it up in here. By the Spirit of God, build it up in here. Look for the opportunities in here. Look to do good in here. Look to be weak in here so that God can show himself strong. Be those disciples like Ubang who didn't know what to do. He just knew to be next to his discipler. He just knew to be there in that moment. And that's going to set you up for the future. That is setting you up for what you're going to do for others as a minister of God, Ubang. Let's go to Acts 9. Acts 9 and verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he, has, he is a chosen instrument of my name to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel." When the Lord called Ananias, it's similar to Moses and Gideon. Ananias is concerned, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. He's, he's considering that it might mean loss for himself. Well, I, this could mean prison. This could mean death. I might be walking into danger, Lord. Well, Lord, it might just be unwise at this time to do this. Lord, I can think of three scriptures right now why this might not be a good time to do this. It might be more prudent for me to just send him a message first, just see how things are going. You know, he could have tried to think his way around obedience. But what would that mean? He'd be disobedient. He didn't do that. He just trusted what the Lord said. But let's think about what the Lord actually told him to do just for a second. 
God didn't say, I want you to go heal the man. He just said he had a vision that you came and prayed for him. He didn't say, I need you to convert Paul, to convert Saul. He said, I just want you to go to this house. He just told him to go. There's really not a whole lot of pressure on Ananias other than what was inside Ananias. His own fear. God didn't tell him all these results are going to be hanging on you. And if you don't get this exactly right, the whole plan's going to fail. Okay, now go. He didn't say you have to go win an argument. He didn't say any of that. He just said go. Go to that man and just go and do what I tell you to do. He just said go. Go with my word and that's enough. And the results aren't your responsibility. You just have to go to the one that the Lord leads you to. But we, we saw it. I mean, we see it in the hospital. N- Nick is in the middle of a trying moment. A trying time. But he still sees the one that the Lord brings in front of him, and he ministers to them. We see it in Paul's life time and time again. It inspires me to make me want to be more like these brothers. Where, where Paul, he, he sees a man in front of him, and he says, Lord, I, th- I think I have something for them. I'm just going to be obedient and just go. And then something happens. Do you know how you know that something happened? They went. Verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. He was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Ananias wasn't concerned with himself anymore. He wasn't worried about the results depending on himself. He was just concerned with being obedient to the Lord. He was just concerned about being available at the right time and going to the one person that the Lord called him to. His sole focus was being the light. And do you know what happened? He took Saul out of darkness. He was blind and in darkness, literally blind and in darkness, no light. But one man who became the light could bring the light to somebody else. And his eyes had light. He began to be disciple. What will your obedience do? Will it save lives? Yes, it will save lives. Will it save lives? Yes. Yes. Your obedience will save lives. It will save the one life that's in front of you. It doesn't depend on you. The the outcome does not depend on you. The obedience depends on you. They're waiting on you. They're waiting on you. And God loved them so much that he sent you. Maybe to die. But are we going to give up our lives willingly or have it taken from us? No, I have more hope and faith and trust in you that you're going to give up your life because you've already given it away. You've already given up your life, so you're going to give it again and again and again for the one life. And that means life for them. Amen. So the one life that was in front of Ananias, this man is then transformed. Let's see what he says, the man that was transformed, Paul. In 2 Corinthians 4, pick it up in verse 11. Y'all go ahead and say light of life when you get there. Come on, light of life. Paul writes, 
For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Amen. So death is at work in us, but life in work in life. So life, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what, when, what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. So again, do we want to give our life or do we want to have our lives taken, saints? Damn right we are. Family, we will always have our life given over to death for the sake of Jesus though not for ourselves, but for the sake of Jesus for the sake of the one life that is in front of us but praise God that he breathes his life into us again praise God that he will continue to get the glory that he desires out of our lives and the lives that, imp that we impact through spiritual obedience saints we have lives out there to go save we don't need a, a a title to do that. We're given a title as sons of God to go, th to go do that. We have been given the right to go and claim authority over other lives for the name of Jesus Christ himself. For the sake of his glory, for the sake of his name, we get to freely give our lives, freely be a light, freely lay down whatever we are so that his name can be glorified. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You have such a high calling. Jaren, you have such a high calling. Abraham, you have such a high calling. Micaiah, you've got a high calling. Daniel Cho, the Lord's called you. He set you apart. Memho, you've got a high calling. You have a high calling because the Lord has called you to be his light in the darkness. You, you are the healing to the blind. You are the strength for the weak. You are the food for the hungry. You are the clothes for the naked. You have such a high calling. He set you apart for this. He's made you for this. He's changed you for this. He's put you in a family for this. He's put you in a house for this. He's built you up. He's raised you from the dead. He's given you sight for your eyes. He's given you light inside of your soul. He's done it for you. And he's called you to do it for them. So you walk worthy of that call. You walk with your head up, not out of pride, but because you're looking. You're eagerly looking for the one that the king desires. His treasure became your treasure. Your treasure became heavenly. So you go in the strength that you have. You become the light in the darkness. You show the world what the Lord has done in you. And then you have power even in weakness. Especially in weakness. It's what others see. That's the light of life that's in you. 
Saints, y'all stand up. I got one more verse to read. Ephesians 5 8 says, You were once darkness, but now you are light. So live as children of light. It's not that you were just in the darkness, you were darkness. Then you started stumbling your way and you were still in the darkness, but now you are in the light and you have become children of light. So live as children of light. Jude 1 verse 20 says, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. We know this verse well. But what I want to encourage you with, as you are building yourselves up, as you are building up the body in here, you will go out there and look for those lives to snatch from the fire. Those that are in darkness, that are darkness, and you will bring them in and help make them children of light. Look, for all that's been done for you, be looking to do it for others. For all that the Lord has done for you, but also what this community has done for you. When I stood in the room with Nick, and I kept going in and out of the room with different pastors and different brothers and elders going in and out again and again, you know what I knew was certain? I love this brotherhood. This is the eternal brotherhood that my God has promised me. And I'm getting to live it and experience it now. And I wouldn't trade it in for anything. You know what that does for me? When I know what God has told me to do. And then my brother is coming behind me and standing behind me in it. I'm like, there's nothing that I can't do. That I can absolutely be the light of life. When Nick is standing there and he doesn't know what to do. And he's the one who's got to go through it. But he turns around and sees his pastors, his elders, and his brothers surrounding him. He says, I can absolutely do this. I still don't know what the next step is, but I'm going to do it when the Lord reveals it. Saints, you are the light of life. There are lives, if we pushed everybody to this side of the room right now, about half of it would be empty. Think about that. We have seats to fill. And God knows it's not for numbers. It's because he has he has souls that are called to be a part of this body there is a life that is going to be placed right in front of you that the lord is saying this is the opportunity do good this is the opportunity even in your weakness i'm going to make you strong this is the opportunity right now seize it even if it costs you your very life so that they can have life we die so that they may live because we know who we are Saints, when you know who you are and you know who your God is, you have a complete and total confidence of your sonship. That cannot be stripped away. God is light. His son Jesus is light and he is the light of life. And you are sons of light. You are the light of life. So as I begin to pray, this is an uplifting message. Yes, there was darkness that we had to go through, but we are light. And you can see that light on display, can't you? That's not just for us. That testimony doesn't, didn't stop on Sunday. It's going to continue. Nick and Anna are going to go see that surgeon here soon. They're going to go see her and they're going to continue to bless her and pour into her. Saints, think about those lives that we've reflected on. That the pastors made us remember, hey, who's that one life? that the Lord has, has put in front of you already. Think about that and go after it. You are the light of life. Father, you have given us a great high calling. God, you have given us life. God, you brought us from darkness into your glorious light. And we are in that kingdom now. And we are walking and living in it now. Father, you are inspiring us right now, Lord, to do your will, to walk in it faithfully. 
God, as we look around, we can see it. And it's not just for our brothers. It is for every single one of us. We're not going to leave the work that you have given us to do to somebody else. God, you have prepared good works in advance for us to do. Lord, you have caused us to rise up in our sonship. Lord, help us to be those lights of life, Lord. God, as we are going out, continue to speak your word to us. Continue to breathe your spirit upon us, Lord, that we would walk in the fullness of the calling, Lord, in a manner that is worthy of the calling that you have placed upon us. In Jesus' name.